Our discussion leader this evening is Dr. Hugh Nibley. Now, I suspect that most everyone here is acquainted with him, at least with some of his writings. Brother Nibley, as you know, has had several series of articles in the Improvement Era and other Church publications concerning a wide range of subjects, the ancient Near East, the primitive Church, uh, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, criticisms of the Book of Mormon. He's published numerous books on the Book of Mormon and these other topics that we've mentioned. The present time, in addition to teaching as a member of our College of Religious Instruction, Brother Nibley has a special assignment with the First Presidency in terms of doing research on various projects that they uh, give to his attention. So it's a uh, true opportunity we have of having here with him with us this evening. I've talked to quite a few colleagues and students uh, even before I came here. I think Brother Nibley was well known and was regarded as one of the great scholars that we have here as a member of our faculty. And I know as one of the younger members of the faculty, I appreciate the example and the pace that he's setting that we need to follow. Well, we trust that the blessings of our Father in Heaven will be with us this evening, and we'll turn the time over to Brother Nibley. Our kind and heavenly Father, we are truly grateful to Thee for this opportunity this night to come here and listen to this lecture by one of Thy servants, Brother Nibley. And we pray while he is giving this talk that he might be inspired, his mind might be enlightened, that he might edify us in coming out to listen, that we might be benefited in many ways in this evening's lecture. We're grateful to Thee for this opportunity, for the blessings that Thou hast bestowed upon us. And we pray that Thou would bless us who have come to listen, that we might have open minds and we might be able to retain some of the things that is told here for our benefit and edification in our future life. We're thankful for this great gospel plan and for the many blessings it brings to us. And we ask again while we assemble this hour, that thy blessings will be with us, or the favors we ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is a, an assigned talk, but it's a not an uninteresting subject. So sit back, close your eyes, get comfortable, pay close attention. I know what kind of copy the girls produce when they write these things from the tape, T-A-P-E, tape. And uh, that means that if I talk the full two hours as fast as I usually go, I'll have months of work correcting the stuff they give to me from this machine. So I'm going to draw it out and make it as slow, excruciating as possible. Now, this subject is Israel's neighbors. <coughs> uh, the first installment of a series that's running in the era now, we had a map. It shows where uh, certain finds were, 20 finds. These are countries around Israel. Now, if you place these discoveries not geographically, but chronologically in their order, you'll see, get a pretty good idea of the steadily expanding knowledge of Israel's relationship to her neighbors. For these great libraries are the records of Israel's neighbors in their dealings with Israel. So, we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Let's go quickly over the major discoveries, arranging them in chronological order. That's what we have here, a review of the problem, you see. Well, it begins in 1851, you see, about uh, over 100 years ago. And it begins here. Incidentally, this is the best, the only map we could get. Uh, Brother Miller Meyer of the, of the uh, Anthropology Department supplied it. Up here, in Nineveh, in 1851, they dis Lyar discovered the great library of Asurbanipal. Now, that was sensational. People quickly reached the conclusion um, that a popular writer on archaeology recently expressed, well, they had found, among other things, the, the flood story. 
impossible to question the fact that the primal version of the biblical legend of the deluge had been found. Well, see if you think it's the primal version or not. The point is, aha, here's where the Bible comes from. See, they leap to that conclusion right away. We're going to bother you with text today. Here, here is the first edition of that. Here's what the text looks like. See, they reproduce it back here. And uh, this is a later, this is a later fragment. But the, uh, I have the, this text of the flood story here. Here's the sort of thing they ran into. Now, this is a publication of 1910, much later, when they found later fragments. When Genesis 6, reading from Genesis 6 and 7, the Lord says, I will loosen. Uh, well, the Bible says, all the foundations of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open. The Nipper version says, I will loosen. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth, says the 11th verse of the 6th chapter, and we shall sweep away all men together, said the Babylonian record. But with thee I will establish my covenant, he says to Noah. Life shall come forth before the deluge cometh forth. Whatever connection that is, I don't know. And he says, And behold, I do bring deluge upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherefore it in, uh, in, wherein is the breath of life from under the heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish. And the Babylonian said, As many as there are, I will bring overthrow, destruction, annihilation. Then he says in the Bible, Make thee an ark. He says in this one, Build a great ship. Thou shalt make it... Length, its dimensions thus, build a ship so and so. A roof shalt thou make to the ark, its entire length thou shalt cover it. The door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. It shall be a houseboat carrying what has been saved of life with a strong roof covering it, as the Babylonian version. It was in Assyrian. It was from the 7th century. And they thought it was the original of the biblical flood story. Well, it's much later than the biblical flood story because they started finding others much older after that, always getting closer and closer to the Bible story, which turns out to be the oldest one after all. But this started raising a question. Now, wait a minute. The Bible isn't the only uh, account of the flood we have. Other people knew about it. And they gave an account very much like the biblical account. They're living over here. And they have their own libraries, and they're not beholden. They're, they didn't get it from the Bible. Well, we know today that this was anything but the primal version of the story. Much earlier versions have been discovered than the primal version. Then... And in 18, come down, 1877, uh, at Tello, or, La, uh, or at uh, Lagash, anciently called Lagash, Tello, uh, de Sarzek discovered a great Sumerian library collection. Uh, Lagash at that time was not a kingdom. It had a patacy. It, it was under another capital. But it left us a very rich cultural remain and uh, some very interesting records and histories. We have them here. Reproduced from an old text. This is Father Dimel's reproduction, and this is the sort of thing they talk about. This is a Sumerian text. This was written about 2500 BC, and it says, The kingship descended from heaven to Eridu. There was the kingship. In Eridu, the king ruled 28,800 years. The kingdom passed over to Babtiira and so forth. Then, Dumuzi, the shepherd, he ruled 36,000 years. Well, Dumuzi is the Tammuz of the Bible, who was a shepherd too. So many years it lists for this dynasty make up 108,000 years. And then the kingship went over to the city of Larak. And then after, then it traces down some more long, fabulous reigns, you see. And then, after 241,200 years, came the great deluge, which destroyed all life. After the flood was ended, the kingship was restored from heaven again. Now we have to skip over here. And the kingship descended in Kish. Notice how many cities are called Kish, as they are in, among the Jaredites. Uh, and Kish, in Kish, Gaur was the king. And then... The kingship is kicked around some more, and Meskalam uh, Dug, Lugan Marda was the shepherd. Then they're ruled, they, they're, as you get down, the rules get shorter and shorter. Twelve kings reigned for 2,300 years, and then Ur of the Chaldees received the kingship, and that becomes the headquarters of everything. That was Abraham's city. Well, this king list goes back and gives fabulous reigns and so forth, but these were real names of real men. And the cities are genuine, 
And as they're described, sure enough, they're discovered, so that's something. Moreover, they knew about the flood again. And they had the idea that kingship was divine and it came from heaven and it was only held by one person at a time. And among the names were that of Tammuz and among the cities was that of Uruk, which is the Eric of the Bible. Again, these people know a good deal about it. And this didn't disturb people at all because they immediately made up their mind the Bible was a fraud. The Bible people had just taken it from these people. So, we'll pile those up over there. So for a long time, it believed that Mesopotamia could move this a little nearer. This is where the Bible stories come from originally. The legends, the stories of the creation, they're in these records. The stories of the flood, the uh, stories of the fall, of the pre-existence, the council in heaven. These all turn up in considerable abundance, especially in the great Enuma Elish text, which was first published in 1876. It was taken for granted that the Bible stories were legendary. Not only were the patriarchs, and e but even the kings of Israel were solar myths. Jesus was only a dying and risen year god of the Babylonians and their neighbors. Well, while Lyard was busy in Babylonia, Fontischendorf was prowling around the Sinai Peninsula. You can find it on there. The map, I say, is rather small. It could be larger. And yet, we go rather far afield, so we'll need all that area, strangely enough. Israel's neighbors finally end up here. These we call Israel's neighbors here and here. That's where we're finding today some neighbors. But uh, they're, they're related. This is a surprising thing we're coming around to now. We're slowly working up to it, you see. Well, there he emerged in 1859 with the Codex Sinaiticus. We have photographs, the whole thing, every page of it. And we have the Alexandrine, we have them all here. And the photographs are just as good as the original. In fact, they're better than the original. They're much easier to read. And uh, <coughs> from that, they reproduced what they... Oh, I didn't bother to bring it along. I had a first edition of the New Testament in the original Greek. Now we know it wasn't in the original Greek at all, but we're talking about the neighbors. Today, Egypt is crediting with being credited with being a far more important neighbor than Mesopotamia. The ideas did not come from... The closest association is not with Mesopotamia, it's with Egypt. This began with the discovery of the Amarna tablets in 1887. <coughs> here I have them all here. The whole shebang the text with a transliteration and fortunately a translation. They're written in standard Aramaic and in a Babylonian language. A library from the middle of the second millennium BC, from 1500, 1400 BC, found up the Nile in Egypt, <laughs> written in Babylonian, but it had nothing to do with the Babylonians. It was strictly a correspondence between the kings of Egypt and the princes up here. The kings of Egypt, the capital of Babylon, Mars is here, and they're led Become the world language, and even the Egyptians used that instead of Egyptian writing to people who weren't Babylonians either. But these records are very interesting because these are written at the very time the children of Israel were supposed to have entered Palestine. This is supposed to have been written at the time of the Exodus, and it shows us conditions that are going on there. These these records do, and this is typical from that time. Um, here's a person. Buraburiash, one of the Canaanite kings, writing to Pharaoh Amenophis IV. Uh, and he says, Our fathers always agreed on these things, and now some of my business people in a caravan have been raided, going through some lands for which you're responsible. He says, Since some of my merchants have been killed and robbed while passing through the southern part of Palestine, which was your protectorate, and he demands uh, restitution. Kenachi is a land under thy dominion, and in thy land my property has been stolen and I have been the victim of roughhouse, he says. Um, and he asked for a settlement here and they take it up and it becomes a long political argument. This is typical of what's going on. Long stories of the bickerings between these princes exactly as the situation is today. The same sordid things happening at Damascus that happen there today. The... Uh, uh, emb emb sir, ambassadors lynched, uh, each other's caravans raided. Everybody's everlastingly complaining that the other person isn't paying him as much as he agreed or that he paid the other person more than he got a receipt for. And this jealousy goes on. And then here's a letter in Mitanni, of all things, a language nobody knew existed. Well, this is strange. These people are up here. And they're very closely related to Israel. Mitanni, these are the people of Midian. 
These are the people so close to Moses. Moses was married into these people. But their language is, is a Celtic language. It's related to Welsh and Highland Scots. What are they doing here in the time of Abraham? They had a huge empire there at that time, and they were very much at home, and they had chiefs with nice Indo-European names. We have one of them, a lot of letters here by a man called Tushrata, writing to Amenophis III, till earlier king. Now, Tushrata, as his name shows, means the rushing wheels, the lord of the chariots. You know what word rod is, rota in Latin, a rod, a wheel in, in German, or anything like that, a rod, a rood, and dash, a dashing rood, dashing wheels, uh, was his name. And he's a great king up there, and his daughter marries Pharaoh. In fact, some think his daughter was this famous, this beautiful queen, Tetuchedip, this uh, queen uh, Nefertiti, whose famous head from the Berlin has been reproduced so often, it's now gone back to Cairo, but she was a beauty. She had no Egyptian blood at all. She was European. I mean, she was Celtic. If any of you are Scotch here, she's related to you. You get into your, your genealogy, you'll probably run into her someday. <laughs> well, this ca comes as a great surprise. At the time this, this volume was got out, nobody could read this language. Nobody knew what it was. Today we know it's related to Hittite and Hathi and, and uh, some of the other Celtic languages there. <laughs> and then, well, we don't, we're going to have to uh, move on here, so we can't... <laughs> Here's a king, the king of Alasya. Here, the king of Alasya, here, which is, which is Cyprus. As you know, you, you fly over in a desert region, you can see all of Cyprus, all at once. I got a picture of it, in fact, rather bad, but the whole island is in there at once. In other words, you see the whole island at the same time. You can see the Lebanon and there, and Lebanon, you can see right over into the Syrian desert, halfway to, to the Euphrates, all at once. And the king of this island is writing and said his. His kingdom has been completely depopulated by the plague. See, this, as the name shows, it's Cyprus, Copper Island. And the king of Egypt has written for a shipment of copper. And he says, I can't give you any more copper because we've had an epidemic and all the cop copper miners died off. And we have nobody here, he says. The hand of Nergal, my lord, has brought a plague on my land and everybody's been killed, especially all the copper workers, he says. Uh, so if you would please sell me, save me, uh, sell me silver in exchange and he wants some herds of oxen from Egypt from the king, his brother here, and he also wants him to send a very interesting thing, uh, one of the haruspices, one of the Roman uh, lookers at birds, a priest who can, oneropolos ochoriston, as Homer would say, they had them around there then, uh, one of the best oneropolos, that means a man who can read omens by watching the flight of birds. Birds can tell you lots of things if you watch them carefully. He wanted that. You thought those came from the Romans, didn't you? Well, here the Egyptian king is being asked for an expert in that art, which the Navajos are especially good at, way back here in 1500 years before Christ. He said, uh, <clears throat> the people of my land are beginning to complain very much because we're sending too much wood to you. The land is being deforested. And we know today it's as bare as the palm of your hand, but it used to bear heavy forests. It was deforested at that early time back there. Well, this is the sort of thing that goes on. Here's another interesting thing. Adad Nirari, one of the kings up here in Syria, writes to the king of Egypt to remind him that they should be friends because his grandfather was installed as king up there by the Egyptian king. And he says, as Mahariba, the king of Egypt, your grandfather made my grandfather king of Nuhase, and you notice what the name shows, bronze country, king of Nuhase, and poured oil upon his head. Then he spake at that time, the one whom the king makes king and upon whose head, uh, whose head he anoints with oil whom the head, king of Egypt comes in here, makes king, and whose head he anoints with oil, let him remain king forever. So he said we should be friends. But notice, back there, the king of Egypt was anointing a, Syria, a Syrian king, making him king by anointing him with oil. And this was before the children of Israel ever came to Jerusalem. This is when they were still in bondage in Egypt. They're just coming out now. And the interesting thing is, the last part of the letters, we find them, as soon as Jerusalem is mentioned, we find about the Hebrews trying to take it, capture it. Well... Here, um, well, let's skip back here to the Hebrews anyway. Here's King Abdiheba. He was the Amorite king of Jerusalem at this time. They'd been ruling Jerusalem for a long time, you see. And he says, they've been slandering me. They're telling the king of Egypt all sorts of bad things about me. Um, then he says, everybody's reporting to the king's representatives here in Jerusalem uh, that I have been uh, playing an underhanded game with the Hebrews who are trying to take the country. 
See, this sort of thing goes on all the time. It still is going on today. It's so thoroughly typical. Everything is intrigue and distrust and murder and propaganda and lies and charges and countercharges all through this thick volume of hundreds of letters. This is 286 here. There are over 300 of them. And he said, don't believe a word about it that, uh, that uh, your representatives, your ambassadors might report to you. They, they say to me, why do you love the Khabiru? Uh, and why do you... Uh, despise the king's regents here. He says, I don't despise the king's agents, and I'm not in cahoots with the Hebrew. Now, at first, this was too good to be true. The Hebrews moving in here, this is a little too early for them, isn't it? What are they doing here? Well, these are their cousins preparing the way for them. This is just before they came and took over. And today, it's, it's acknowledged by everybody that these were the Hebrews. For many years, up until just five years ago, they said, well, anything that sounded like that was too good to be true, so nobody believed it. These must, can't be the Hebrews. It just says Hebrews is all. It must be somebody else. You had to be scholarly about it. You couldn't be so naive as to say when it says Hebrews, it must be the Hebrews. Uh, because the only city, the only city they're mentioned in connection with is Jerusalem. A pure coincidence, you see. But today, they don't dispute it anymore. He says the entire land, this is the land of Jerusalem, is going, is falling. Thy enemies have... Uh, become mighty because the king of Egypt has been indolent and hasn't raised his hand to help him, he says. Um, but you pay no attention to me. All your regents, all your representatives here, he says, have, are without authority. The Hebrews are plundering the lands of the king all around with impunity. They're taking over and they're moving in. He says, I throw myself at the foot, in another letter here, uh, I throw myself seven times seven at the foot of the king. All the countries around here, see, are, are falling. All the villages are in flame. The land of Gazri, the land of Ascalon, have already turned over and surrendered to the Hebrews. They've given them food, they've given them oil, they've given them supplies. And this land of Jerusalem, and he calls it Jerusalem, here the mighty hand of the king must come to my support. For, this is a very interesting thing, for the sons of Laban have betrayed the land of the king into the hands of the Hebrews. Sons of Laban. Now, you wonder why this Laban in the Book of Mormon, such a rat, was uh, in charge of the garrison there. It might have been, you see, a hereditary office handed down, an honorary title. Remember, he swaggered around in all his armor and his uh, ceremonial armor and this sort of stuff with his gold sword, gold handle sword. And uh, it might have been that their family had that charge because at the same time, remember, when the Hebrews entered Jerusalem, uh, when they took over the temple there, they didn't take over, they built another, but before David built the temple, he gave the priesthood to the, um, to the Zadokites, to Zadok, who was a Jebusite. He wasn't a descendant of Israel at all. And who was Zadok? He was a direct descendant of Melchizedek. Well, what was Melchizedek bidding in Jerusalem? He'd always been in there. He was there in the days of Abraham. See, he wasn't related to Abraham, but he was a righteous king, and he'd become king in Jerusalem. So there was a priestly line, and it's an interesting thing we know now from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that when David came in and occupied Jerusalem, he gave the priesthood to one of the priests, to the high priest, Zadok, who was already there, who wasn't a, one, of, one of the children of Israel, but who was a descendant of Melchizedek. So he had the right to it. And ever since then, the title remained in the Zadokite line until it was disputed. A big fight about that later on. But it's interesting here that somebody betrayed the Jerusalem into the hands of the Hebrews, and his name here is given as the sons of Labiah. Elsewhere in these letters, they're, they're called the sons of Labian. The sons of Labian, the sons of Laban. That's just a guess. But it shows you the type of things that's, that are going on here. The, uh, uh, <clears throat> here he says, the king has sent a, an inspector to come up and report on the deteriorating situation around Jerusalem. It reminds you of Vietnam. He says, a man by the name of Paru has come to the land of Jerusalem to expect and report uh, that the caravans of the king have been stopped now. Uh, the king has established his name in the land of Jerusalem forever and ever. He can't let it down now. He says, send troops, whatever you do. Um, and then he talks about the whole land of the king is going lost. Here he mentions them again. Naharima and the Caspi have moved in, but now the Chabirum has taken all the cities of the king. No, regi no regent, this is a later letter, see, no representative of the king of Egypt is left here. They have all fled. They have all cleared out. The Hebrews have taken over. Um, they've gone to seek refuge in Lachish um, you have sacrificed your servants they have all gone over and joined the Habiro he said and joined the Hebrews 
There's a revolution in the land. All the people that were supporting Egypt now are on the side of the Hebrews. They only went over. So here are the Hebrews coming into Egypt. Well, this was a, a most remarkable discovery, of course, because it brings the Jews into the pictures. The discovery of inscriptions shortly after this, from a slightly earlier period, in, this, in the Sinaitic inscription, the Sinai Peninsula, uh, in the salt mine, in the mine here, they discovered a lot of inscriptions uh, written with Egyptian hieroglyphics, but they weren't Egyptian. They used the sound values of these Egyptian symbols to uh, write their own language, and it turns out that their own language was Canaanitish, was a North Semitic, and very close to Hebrew. In fact, it was Hebrew. So as a result, today... First of all, there was a big dispute. They said, all right, look, the Jews got their alphabet from the Egyptians, and they got it when they came down as seasonal workers in the mines down in Sinai. But now we found out that this Hebrew alphabet goes clear back to 18th century B.C. They had it first in Canaan before that. But the Sinaitic version was adopted by all the Semitic-speaking people in the West around 1200 B.C. It's a new picture of Egypt. You see, very close Egyptians and Hebrews and Canaanites working together continually for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. All the time, Egypt is very close to, to, uh, to Canaan and to Israel. So, these contacts were, were clarified by excavations at Byblos up on the Syrian coast, which have been continued to the present time. While I was there recently, they had just found an Egypt, a, a temple just jammed full of Egyptian vessels, beautiful beautiful uh, alabaster vessels from the Old Kingdom to celebrate the jubilee of King Pepe I of the Sixth Dynasty. He, they didn't realize that he was going to go on for, for 52 more years after his jubilee. He re, it was a long, no, for longer than that, for 58 more years. It was, and the jubilee was when he'd reigned 30 years already. It was the longest reign in history. But here they celebrated his reign in a temple in Byblos up here. They don't have any other around here. This is the only thing they've got. Well, uh, <coughs> someday the school will acquire a map. We, we went to half a dozen departments to try to get a map. Nobody had a map in the Near East. Uh, well, this on the coast. And Biblos, not only there, but we have lots of stuff. Inscriptions in Egyptian from pre-dynastic times, from the times before there were kings in Egypt, before the first dynasty, that is, there were kings. Before the first dynasty, we find very active trade with, with Beirut and with Byblos. Uh, the oldest ships in the world were sailing there, and they were big ships. They would carry mostly this timber. They were for bringing timber to Egypt from the Lebanon, bringing these huge cedar logs, which were so valuable, way back there. And then, in the next year after this was discovered, Byblos, uh, they discovered the in Sinai, this discovery in Sinai was discovered up the Nile, way up the Nile. First cataract was discovered the, uh, the library of a colony of Jews that lived up there in the century after Lehi. The very, in this area was discovered in... Um, these are the, the elephantine letters. Well, an elephantine is way up the Nile here. And here were Jews living in the 5th century and 6th century B.C. And they write letters back to Jerusalem asking for permission to rebuild a temple. Well, what were they building a temple there for? Oh, they said, we build a temple. How did they get down there? Well, Professor Albright discovered when Jerusalem fell at the time of Lehi, they all fled, you see, in all directions, and these people went up the river, and the first thing they did was build a temple there. Well, everybody said the only temple could have to be in Jerusalem. They couldn't have any other temple like that. Remember, the first thing Lehi did when he settled was build a replica of Solomon's temple. That's exactly what these people did. And we have the letters here. They're all here. We'll read you from one about the temple. It says there, it gives the, the text here. They're in Aramaic. And then it says, a certain rascally official has ordered the temple to be destroyed. Remember, this is during the Persian occupation. So this brings the Persians into the picture. And then he said, they can't do this. The temple which is in Yeb, that's Elephantine, the Egyptians call it Yeb, and our word ivory comes from there. Geb, you see, Yebri. And um, 
Yeb was as far... See, that was the cataract, and they'd bring the stuff from Central Africa up there, and then they'd have to transship it because they couldn't get boats over there, and then it'd go down the Nile. And this was the big ivory center. So our word ivory comes from there, and here they are in these old letters, but it's much older. We have writings about Yeb from 27, 2800 B.C., way back there. But it's still called Yeb, and... Uh, he tells how they destroyed it. He says, Already in the days of the kings of Egypt, before Persian occupation, our fathers had built that. This is back in Lehi's day, you see. Our fathers had built that temple at the fortress of Geb. And when Cambyses came to Egypt, that was in 552. See, that was 50 years after Lehi left Jerusalem, 48 years. But the temple was already standing. And when, our fa and when Cambyses came into Egypt, he found that temple built. And he ordered the other temples of the Egyptian gods to be shut up, but he c allowed this temple to continue operation. The Persians were usually good friends with the Hebrews, as you know. Cambyses was the son of that Cyrus who uh, restored Jews to the temple, uh, to Jews to their temple. No, or rather, he is the other Cyrus. In fact, the first. Uh, <clears throat> and so he said, you don't want to uh, destroy the temple now. And he says... When, the, when this was done, we with our wives and our children put on sackcloth and fasted and prayed to Jehovah the Lord of heaven who let us see our desire upon that Wendrang. He was the man who, uh, Wendrang, he was the man who destroyed the temple and they had their vengeance on him but they prayed to the God, to Jehovah to re avenge themselves. Well, here's the Jews having a temple way up the Nile back in the 6th and 7th centuries B.C. A surprising thing. The Egyptians becoming closer and closer, more and more intimate as friends of the, as uh, neighbors to Israel. Well, in the same year as this discovery, in 1906, there was unearthed at Bokaz Khoi in the heart of Asia Minor, a huge library written in cuneiform on clay tablets in what was later discovered to be, well, there's lots of good purists. You know, the purists, uh, the period, the up here, the up here in the same year, this was but Hittite wasn't uh, deciphered for 20 years after that. People always held up until 1926. They believed the Hittites were a myth. There never had been such a people. Now we realize they ruled one of the largest empires in the world and one of the most important at the time of Abraham. These non-Semitic languages, well, the Amarna letters were also in cuneiform. Uh, though they were written between the Egyptians and Canaanites, neither of whom used it as their own language. The Amarna tablets also contain a number of tablets in unknown languages, namely Azarwa. Well, these Bogas Koita uh, finds up there in Asia Minor explained this. These non-Semitic languages spoken in and around Palestine during the middle of the second millennium were the languages of the ruling caste of a mixture of peoples that invaded Egypt and Babylonian India and the West all at once in the 18th century B.C. Big invasions... The people of the mountain, Alarodians in various names, the Kassites invaded here. At the same time, the Amorites came in here. At the same time, the Hyksos went into Egypt. Later on, the people of the sea followed them. And these people that invade all the, the classic lands way back in the 18th century B.C. were our relatives and ancestors. The leaders had good Indo-European names. And um, from then on, they're there to stay. And they're very close to the Israelites. They're, they intermarry very much with them, especially Abraham holds the key here because Abraham moved them. Remember, he bought all his land from Hittites. He made all his deals with Hittites. Um, the uh, Bogas Koi finds, then these people founded great kingdoms and even empires. Those are the Hyksos, the Mitanni, Luristan. These are new kingdoms just discovered in the last few years, the last ten years. They're kingdoms like here, like Luristan down here, like Mani, like Urartu, the kingdom of Van, the Nuhasi, dozens of kingdoms down there. These mountain people, but their rulers were this ruling caste, this ruling class. Sometimes the people themselves, Mitanni, was the main center, and later it was taken over by the Hittites. But they were all cousins to each other, all, all related. Up until the decipherment of Hittite after 1926, scholars actually considered the Hittites who figure in the biblical history of Abraham as either a scribal error or a myth. In 1925 and 26, the archives of the Hurrians, a hitherto unknown people, were discovered at Nuzi. At the same uh, year that this was finally deciphered, here at Nuzi, way up here, they discovered the archives of the Hurrians. Well, they're the eastern cousins of the Hittites. And um, 
they took over Palestine so that later on the Egyptians always called the Palestinian Ahurian, Pahor. And so we have Pahoran in the Book of Mormon. It simply means the man of Palestine. It's a good Egyptian name. And the name occurs, actually it occurs already in the, in the uh, Amarna tablets. Well, these Nuzi tablets give a full and vivid picture of private and public business in a world that began to look more and more like Abraham's world. Then in 1929, in Ugarit, way up here on the north of the coast, they discovered the library at Rosh Shama. These were Phoenician people. These were Canaanitish people. The library, the language is in Canaanite mostly. There are three different people there, but mostly Canaanites and very closely related to the Hebrews. The, the language is almost Hebrew. These baffled translation for a while because they were in cuneiform and then it suddenly occurred to someone they were in a simple alphabet. They, were, they only, only used 25, 26 characters, used a regular alphabet, but since they were in cuneiform, everybody thought it must be something terribly hard. They turned out to be in an alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, the same order of letters as in the Hebrew alphabet, showing how extremely old the Hebrew alphabet really is and how old Hebrew is and how old this, this culture is. Moreover, the archives from Ugarit here were temple archives. Along with business records, we have the archives of their temple, what their ordinances and rites. And these cast an enormous lot of light on the passages we'd never understood in the Bible. The... Uh, <coughs> Well, here. I guess we can read you some here. Now, a few years ago, just in 1960, they discovered... Uh, six, uh, let me see, yes. In 1960, they discovered 30 more big crates. I, I saw what they were like in the museum there. They, uh, 30 more crates of tablets were discovered in 1960 here. So they haven't come out yet. Nobody knows what's in them. At the time this was edited, these were all the texts available. This is as of 1949. But this is what they are talking about. Their ritual texts and things like that. This is what's going on. Toward the convocation of the assembly in the midst of the mountain of the Lord at the feet of Ael, do not fall. Ael is the word they use for God here, just as you do in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The very same word you use um, 16, 1700 years later in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The word for God is Ael. Do not prostrate yourself before the convocation of the assembly. What we have here is an assembly describing a council in heaven and somebody who turns out to be Satan is arguing against, uh, against a plan that's been given here. Toward the mountain of Ale, toward the convocation of the assembly, the gods had come and they sat down to hold the assembly and they hailed Baal as the principal god but there was someone who refused to humiliate himself. And they said, Why do you fall down and worship Baal? Why, O oh gods, have ye lowered your heads on the top of your knees, yea, upon the thrones of your lordship? Then there is a rebellion about the succession, and these old temple texts goes, go on here. It talks about the, the drought, then it describes some of the ritual. Then he says, I have a word that I shall tell thee, a matter that I'll declare to thee. Tis a word, the word of the tree, the, the tree of wisdom here. Yea, the whispering of the stone, the council of heavens to the earth, of the deeps to the stars. I understand the lightning which the heavens do not know, a matter that men do not understand, nor the multitudes of the earth understand. Notice, this is the language of Job. This is the language of apoc apocryphal writing, isn't it? Uh, it sounds very Gnostic also. And this is actually the source of a lot of that stuff. We, we trace it down in unbroken succession. But when it talks about the, the murmur of the heavens to the earth, remember, remember the psalm, uh, the heavens and earth speak to each other, and the murmur of heaven to the earth, of the deeps to the stars, I understand the lightning which the heavens do not know, a matter that men do not know, nor the multitudes of the earth understand. And then there's practically quotations from Revelations 13 here. I crushed the writhing serpent, the accursed one of the seven heads. I crushed Mot, the darling of the devil, the serpent, the evil serpent who overthrow, the one who drove out Baal from the heights of Sapan. He was, he was driven and uh, descended. Well, that long mountain, a snow-covered ridge looking very much like Timpanocus was the mountain Sapan. It's quite high. And uh, well, I was up on the round. It didn't get to the top, but quite recently up there they have discovered signs of great conflagrations. This is where they used to burn the fires to Baal, up on the top of that mountain. It's mentioned repeatedly here. And here's a surprising thing. The two oldest people in the East are the Egyptians and the Sumerians. And the original home of the gods of the Sumerians was this very same mountain 
as the gods of the Canaanites, this mountain of Shaphan. No Shaphon, notice it's the mountain of the north, the mountain where the devil set himself up. Well, you run into all sorts of traditions and uh, familiar tags, bits of Old Testament lore and, and um, things you run into in the Jewish scriptures. This, this Rosh Hashanah revolutionized everything because this was right at the center. What you find here is very close to the Greek drama and very close to the Old Testament at the same time. Well, here's a Greek drama a good thousand years before Thespis is supposed to have written the first Greek drama. What are you going to do there, you see? Uh, everything is being tied together now. What I should do here is, is uh, stick to the text. It might make clear uh, when we're getting here. Now, let me see. Oh, we forgot to bring this one along. Well, you can be glad of that. In 1930, they discovered the Chester Beatty papyri. We have beautiful reproductions of them, colored everything just as they were. I would read you some of the newly found Book of Noah from that. That would be very nice. A new flood of light on the patriarchal age came with the discovery of the Mari Library in 1935, a great library discovered up here in 35, on the upper Euphrates, way up there. Nobody ever thought the Sumerians ever were that far, but there they are, way up there. And here we're taken right into the world of Abraham. The same sort of deals are being made, the same laws are being observed, the same great men traveling with their families, making bargains to settle, uh, fighting as they go, joining up with kings and leading expeditions against uh, coalitions of kings. It's exactly as Abraham operates in the, whole, in the same area. Well, almost at the same time and under much the same conditions, the oldest Jewish library in the world, the oldest Christian, were discovered in 1947. The Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nag Hammadi Library discovered at the same time. Well, here, for example, we have the, among the Dead Sea Scrolls from the cave, this is the, called the Genesis Apocrypha now, it's the story of Abraham in Egypt. It's a much different, it's a much fuller story than we have in the Bible, much fuller, and of course it's very interesting in view of the Pearl of Great Price. We can't, can't talk about it now, it tells how Abraham went into Egypt to, with Saren and how Pharaoh got sick and how Abraham laid his hands on his head and administered to him and how Abraham, the Pharaoh then wanted to make a covenant with Abraham and give him his authority just as it says in the Pearl of Great Price had him sit on his throne and, and uh, remember hold this, the insignia of his authority Abraham could not uh, exchange the compliment he therefore fell into disfavor with Pharaoh and had to leave but he left a rich man it all had to do with his holding the priesthood all sorts of things in here about Abraham this was discovered in 1947 and a very old text here we have pictures of the text here and, th and then they're, when it's unrolled see they're all nicely reproduced and uh, transliterated here the reproduction, I assure you, are much better than the original. They are taken with uh, infrared and much easier to read. So, oh, this takes a different type of neighbor, incidentally. These neighbors are the people in the desert around there and deal with various sectarians, we should mention. Well, from this brief and superficial sampling of the sort of thing that's been going on, it will appear that the emerging picture of the Bible word has been drawn largely in terms of Israel's relationship to her neighbors. Notice very little new information on the Bible comes out of Israel itself. It's the neighbors that are supplying it all. Well, some does, but we don't bring that in. We have enough. We have our hands full with the neighbors in the time we have here. But actually, these are the most important finds. First, Babylonia commanded attention as the very source of basic biblical teachings of creation, the early days of mankind. Then the center of gravity shifted to Egypt. Then a number of unknown peoples intrig intruded on the scene with the Hittites at their head. Then the early Greeks were dragged in, and finally the Romans. This is the new development now, with Cyrus Gordon and others at its head. He isn't the only one. Are bringing the Greeks into the picture very closely, that they are very close cousins to the Jews. Um, along the more intimate, uh, all along, the more intimate neighbors of Israel are not neglected. What about the closer people, the people in the desert right around them? In 1886, Wellhausen's famous prolegomena to the history of Israel traced the Old Testament practices and beliefs back to the primitive tribes of the desert. So they jumped at this conclusion. I happen to have a... Oh, I left it in the office. I have a first edition of that, so it's, it's just as well. I left it there, too. But... Uh, here they said, look, all the ancient customs of Israel uh, are found among the tribes of the desert, among the primitive Arabic tribes. In the following years, folklore and higher criticism forced the whole Bible picture into conformity with an evolutionary pattern, beginning with these primitive desert people living right on the spot, you see, and culminating in Fraser's world picture of all religions passing through the same inevitable stages of development independently and in total isolation from each other. 
However, Fraser's successors at Cambridge, successors at Cambridge, continued to accumulate and compare information until by 1930 they had changed the picture completely. They arrived at a totally different picture of things. The pattern of the ancient coronation rites throughout the world, for example, they found to be at once far too elaborate and far too uniform to have been the product of spontaneous generation by primitive people. And the years between their two studies of ritual and kingship, 1930 to 1958, saw the filling in of the gaps everywhere. This is the salient characteristic of our own time, the filling in of the gaps, so that all these people are actually related to each other, closer and closer and closer. Let's see what's been going on, what it may signify. Consider the situation of Mesopotamia today. Ah, Babylonian, we're coming to two, section two here. Abraham, we are told, is a typical apiru, an outsider, a trader, an official, and a warrior. These were called in Babylonian lore uh, the Tamkaru, and... Uh, Sure enough, Abraham comes from Ur of the Chaldees. He began there, you see. But today they say it, it might not have been that Ur down at the bottom of the river. It might have been one of the other Urs because this is a new development that's very important, namely the duplication of names everywhere. I just read an article where it said when you come upon a name like uh, Judah or uh, Mesir, Egypt, it, it doesn't mean Judah or Mesir. Well, you, it might, but it might not. Because of colonization, from the earliest times they colonized and they always named the colonies after the places they come from and the same people and so forth. So it could be Judah, could be many places. And the same thing with Ur. A lot of Urs have now been found. Ur of the Chaldees may be up there in Haran, way up in the north, in the mountains, in Syria. Uh, or it may still have been the old Ur. But this is a complication. We could have uh, been warned by the Book of Mormon to look out for that because they came over here and started duplicating. All the names were spread around here. Well, just like our own ancestors when they came here, they started giving old world names to places here. But um, also the duplication of names raises new issue. There were at least five kings by the name of Hammurabi, which was the one that Abraham had his dealings with. It didn't have to be the great Hammurabi. It could have been one of the others. And uh, Hammurabi's date has been changed, as you know, has received a serious jar recently. They've ha had to knock 200 years off the whole chronology of the ancient world. It had to been, has been brought down because of Hammurabi for a couple of hundred years. When I went to school, the greatest authority on Hebrew myths was Ignatius Goldsealer, who was convinced that the patriarchal history of the Old Testament was pure mythology, based on, this is quoting him, on the impression made on man by various phenomena of nature. And that these myths, he said, developed into either religion or history. Today that sounds like something out of the speculations of ancient Alexandria or Basra. Simply fantastic. And yet when I went to school we were given that as the scientific fact. That's the way it is. They couldn't have been further wrong. Today all the patriarchs are flesh and blood people. Abraham is out... Nelson Gluck has shown, really did fight with Kerdala Omer in the Negev. He really was at home in the cosmopolitan capitals of Mesopotamia, Syria, and Egypt, as Woolley showed. He really did bargain with Babylonian, Syrian, and Hittite lords and officials, as Albright and Gordon have shown. There was nothing primitive about him. The old law of an eye for an eye is, W. Lambert has recently demonstrated, the new man at uh, Johns Hopkins, is, he says, contrary to what might be expected from an oversimplified evolutionary approach, a late comer in Mesopotamian law. You only find the old law of, of uh, eye for an eye coming at a very late time. It's not primitive at all. Likewise, the gods of Babylonia are, are not ancient. They're a holdover from primitive times and an, a, la, a later elaboration of the theologians, he said. So when you find the ancient gods, they come late. They're an invention of the poets later on in the theologians. But when you go back to these early records that have so much in common with Egypt, you don't have a lot of gods running around. Uh, <clears throat> around 2000 B.C., the Amorites started moving into Mesopotamia, bringing with them a language closely akin to Canaanite, but according to Lambert, by the time they reached the south, they spoke the old Babylonian dialect. Well, the point is that we have a constant moving about and fusing of language and ideas and culture all over this, this area. Samuel Kramer has shown that the earliest records of Mesopotamia, the earliest, those of the Sumerians, describe an epic milieu, that is, a time of world migrations and heroic traditions, a state of things closely resembling that obtaining in other epic li literatures, whether it's from Germany, England, or wherever it is, and uh, very much, of course, like the story of Ether, like the Jaredite story. From the first, it was noticed that there are remarkable parallels between the Gilgamesh epic, the earliest epic we know about, the Genesis, yes, but the Greek epics of Homer and Hesiod. The Gilgamesh story is very old. Not only is it found in the first written records, but it's represented on seals a thousand years older than those records, the earliest story we know about. 
not only its version of the flood story, this is where you get your flood story from there, it's substantially the same as that of the Old Testament, but now we find out it contains the gist of the whole first ten chapters of Genesis, the more recently discovered Akrahasis version. It's called the Atrahasis uh, uh, text. This is the oldest version we have of this, the story of the flood as told to Gilgamesh by Noah, and he tells him this, the whole first ten chapters of Genesis, way back here in the oldest records we have. The importance of this epic, writes Lambert, is that it has the same outline as the early chapters of Genesis and the Greek and Roman myths of origins best known from Ovid's Metamorphosis. Well, the Greeks and Romans told the same story, yes. They had the same stories and told the same things. Well, how does that happen? We're about to consider that. The, uh, well, actually, we're going to have to skip along. These are not merely stories. They have eschatological import. These people are trying to answer the great questions of life and so on and so on. During the 1920s and 30s, a controversy raged as to who had priority in these things, Mesopotamia or Egypt, which is the older. Well, that was settled before long. It's settled now. Neither. It didn't begin in Egypt and it didn't begin in Babylonia. We don't know where this story began. This st the story of creation and the flood and all this sort of thing. They don't tell identical stories, but obviously they're using the same sources and we don't know what the source is. It does not originate in Mesopotamia or Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> we do not dwell on the intimacy of Egypt and Israel throughout history. That's well enough known. The, uh, well, the Ectum test, we don't need in. We're going to have to skip down here. Well, Egypt is full of Israel, and Ig Israel is full of Egypt. Rel literary ties between the two cultures are becoming more obvious every day. Driotton showed that just before his death that one of the classic works of Egyptian wisdom literature, now you have this great wisdom literature, and they sound very much alike, the wisdom literature, the same philosophy, and they go back to the very beginning. And uh, it was finally recognized that the Hebrew wisdom literature is just like the Egyptian, and we might as well stop kidding ourselves, they belong to the same tradition. But Driotton showed that the one of the most important wisdom texts was the same among the Jews, among the Hebrews and the Egyptians, because the Egyptians had got it from the Hebrews, not because the Hebrews had got it from the Egyptians. The Egyptians had the oldest, the Hebrews had the oldest version of the wisdom literature. And the same thing goes for the Babylonian wisdom literature. Quite recently, a big collection of it's been made, that big book there, by Lambert. We may have a chance to refer to it later. Well, we have lots of examples here. The lives of Moses and Joseph and Abraham are closely bound not only with Egypt, but specifically with Egyptian religion. Joseph married the daughter of the high priest of Heliopolis, of On. He was the great seer, the highest Egyptian religious official next to Pharaoh. Moses himself was, according to Josephus, a priest of, of On. Uh, this is the On of the Bible. On was the prehistoric center of what is now designated as the Memphite theology. And it is only in the last few years that scholars have brought themselves to admit that the intimate resemblance of Memphite theology not only to the stories of Genesis, but to the Gospels, as w especially of John, is not just a coincidence. This is being traced back now. See, the thing is, Joseph married into the high priestly family of On. Moses was a high priest of On, according to Josephus. The, the uh, Jews were very closely connected. Now, we, the oldest document in the world, older even than anything found in Babylonia, supposedly, is the Shabako stone. I mentioned that. Well, now, this Shabako stone is the old ritual of On for the dedication. And it's just, it's a very familiar document. It would be very familiar to you if we started reading it. I have a reproduction of it. And uh, it's come in for a lot of study recently. It, this is known as the Memphite theology. That's the remainder of the stone. Uh, the Memphite theology. And this Memphite theology carries right on down through the Old Testament, right into the Gospel of John and into the Gospels. Unbroken succession. This is what a lot of people are pointing out today. We, we could read you from that. We're not going to have time to read from these various records, are we? Um, well, H.H. H. Rowley says, The view that the Hebrew prophets were an entirely unique phenomenon in religious history of the world is one that cannot be maintained. There were prophets in other world, in other countries. The Egyptians had genuine prophets that talked just like the Hebrew prophets. The Greeks had genuine prophets that talked just like, genuine or not, they talked just like the Hebrew prophets. The Babylonians have prophets that talked just like the Hebrew prophets up to a point. It has become quite impossible because of this, this 
finding at Mary. For example, at Mary we found a big prophetic literature, prophets. Well, here's where Abraham was too. It has become quite impossible, he says, to treat Hebrew prophecy as an isolated phenomenon. Well, it's clear enough from the Bible that Israel's closest neighbor geographically and culturally was Canaan. But, well, here we go into, into Rosh Shamra. Well, let's just read a quotation in 1960 from Gordon. He says, The location of Ugarit, that's where this library was, up on the north Syrian coast, is such that, it, that in it the currents of the Semitic and Indo-European worlds crossed. The Semitic cultural elements, though basically those of Canaan, included a strong mixture from Mesopotamia. Notice they're all mixing in. Indo-European. Here we find a library with books by people from here, by people from here. There are Egyptian, lots of Egyptian there. There's lots of Babylonian and, uh, and uh, Sumerian, not, not really Sumerian, Mesopotamian. There's lots of Hittite, there's lots of Hurrian, very close connections with the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. My, since 1955, we've discovered that these people were actually Greeks all along. Nobody knew that. So, very closely connected with the Greeks, all mingling together there. And this was going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And these people are the closest cousins to the Jews. And the Greeks are our own cousins too. So everybody's turning out to be related to, be, to everybody else. The, he says, the Semitic cultural elements, though basically those of Canaan, included a strong mixture from Mesopotamia. The Indo-European elements, that's ours, embraced the Hittite and especially the Minoan, two different families of Indo-European. Since that was written, it's been shown that Minoan, or more probably Mycenaean, was actually Greek 600 years before Homer. In the records, we are made aware of the actual presence here in Ugarit, in this city, all at once, rubbing elbows, were people from Arad, from Beirut, from Byblos, from Tyre, Sarepcha, Akka, Joppa, Yabna, Amarea, Nuchasi, Sibaria. There were Assyrians, Alassians, people from Cyprus, people from Greece, people from Egypt, people from Lycia, people from Spain, people from Aramea, everywhere. We're all together there all the time. We find there the rites and ordinances of the later temples and festivals at Jerusalem explained. We find the prototype of the Hebrew kingly cult as represented in the Psalms of David. We find, quote, our own ancestral alphabet from the 17th century B.C. Our own alphabet, mind you. We find an eschatology that is cosmic and not local with a God who is the Lord of the entire earth, not the Baal of Ugarit or Byblos or Tyre or Sidon, but king over all the grand earth. We find the origin of the Greek theater. We find the bridge between the great epic literature of Mesopotamia, of Greece, and of India. Because this is an interesting thing. So many of the proper names of the great chiefs and merchants that did business here were Indian, were the, were the, Eastern, uh, uh, the Eastern Iranian, whether Iranian, but the Eastern branch that went down into India at this very same time. They're the very same people. So India, there's not a country here that isn't included in this city. You would have met people from everywhere. And they have the records there. And these people were very close to the Jews. This is the interesting thing. Closer to the Jews than to anybody else. Um, we find for the, from the first, for the first time all along with our own alphabet, people speaking languages demonstrably related to our own, and we find proof of the historicity of the patriarchal narratives of the Old Testament while explaining the literary peculiarities of the latter which long led higher critics to suppose the Old Testament was a patchwork of editing and composition. It's not a patchwork or anything of the sort. Well, uh, how is Israel connected with these people? Here we have Indo-European rulers, rulers at Ugarit, rulers from the mountains, from the steppes, and from the islands. There were people here from all the mountain ranges along here, going clear down here. People from the steppes, they'd come in from here. They were in here, and especially from the Terranian steppe. And people from the islands of the sea as far east, as, as, as far west as probably the Atlantic. They're turning up here. Well, what have they got to do with Israel? This is the point. Our neighbors are getting spread out pretty well. Uh, such a fundamental institution as the Leverate, marrying your... Uh, a woman marrying her husband, her late husband's brother in order to have children to him. That's a Hittite institution. It's not a Semitic institution. Abraham in Hebron lives by Hittite law. Uh, Ezekiel 16.3 actually tells the people of Jerusalem they are a mixture of Amorites and Hittites. And the Hittites, remember, the name shows, the Hittites from here, they'd come in from this side. Their other cousins were off here, the Hurrians. But they were all related. They're, they'd come in in several waves. But they were also the Kati related to the Kotarian down here, and way off here they have the, um, in Kotan, nearly to the Pacific, way up here 
They were speaking the early form of our language was being spoken up here before these people ever went in there. So they were spread from here clear over to here because they're related, you see, to the Welsh and the Scots and those people and spread all over the place and especially they're close to Abraham. Abraham marries sons and daughters into the Hittites. Some of them he tells not to marry, remember, but others do marry into the families of the Hittites. His best friends are, are Hittites. He does, remember, he buys his father's grave. He buys his own farm from from a Hittite and lives there by Hittite law. The dealings he makes are according to the Hittite law we know now. One of the unique glories of early hero, Hebrew uh, literature, as of the Greek literature, was their willingness to write history. This was a thing the Hittites gave them too, writing uh, honest history instead of uh, polemic or, or myths. And uh, the strict patriarchal order of the family is characteristically Hittite as is the royal progress, the ideals of chivalry. When one considers that their language was a Celtic tongue related to Highland Scots and Welsh, one realizes that because of their discovery, writes J. Patterson, an authority on the Hurrians, he says, the Old Testament horizon must now be expanded and its history interpreted against this larger background. Indeed, he says, we must learn to hold converse with the whole universe. To understand the Old Testament, especially the patriarchal time, you've got to take all these people into consideration because they belong right in the picture. And yet, as late as 1926, scholars seriously maintained that the mention of the Hittites in the Old Testament was simply a scribal misunderstanding. That's a quotation. The Hebrews designated as Hittite whatever was non-Semitic, and the Assyrians seemed to use the word Hittite in the same loose fashion. Actually, as Albright notes, it's better to think of the Hittite culture as highly syncretistic, that's a mixture of lots of things, and not as a homogeneous civilization. Often they are equated with the Hurrians that being their eastern or possibly the original Asiatic branch of the family, as against the later Hittite occupation of the West. According to Gitterbock, the Hittite writings, while containing Babylonian material, demonstrate the Hurrian background of Hesiod's Theogony, the earliest Greek uh, writing, uh, religious writing. Right through the northern belt of the highlands, we find the great mixing of peoples under Indo-European lords who represent a common face everywhere. The Khafaji vase, from way over here, Khafaji vase, looks exactly like the earliest Greek vases we find, and the, uh, these steppe people, as gets a column, actually ruled the world between 1800 and 1750 B.C. Even Egypt, being but a province of their empire, whose center was to be sought somewhere in Asia. They invaded, ruled, and occupied all these countries, and their blood is still in all of them. And they're intimately intermarried in Abraham's family, too. They're the cousins of the Mitanni, whose great empire immediately succeeded theirs. Were the Mitanni, the biblical people of Midian, so closely associated with Moses? Some scholars think so. Their name has also been equated with Maidan, with Manda, the people of the hordes, which describes them very well, as well as with Mada, from which the later Medes, the people of the many. These run into the Urartu, the Sumerians, the Scythians, the Armenians, and all our ancestors were right there. They can be traced right back to these people here, and very close to Palestine at this time. The point is that no matter how we designate these people, they spoke a language akin to ours and were probably in our line of genealogy. And at the same time, they enter into the Bible picture, not in some late or exotic form, but fundamentally and from the very beginning. The aforementioned Nuzi tablets, the most eloquent testimonial to the real world of Abraham, are actually Hurrian, Nuzi being a Hurrian community. While the Haran area, remember the area came from Haran, is where Abraham's ancestors came from. That's where his father Terah was from, you see. And he went back there and settled. Uh, from which Abraham's family originally came, lay within the confounds of the Hurrian kingdom of Mitanni. The Egyptians even called Canaan the Huri land, so that the familiar late Egyptian name Pahoran in the Book of Mormon actually means the man from Palestine. Late in life, we find so Pahoran, and also because of his family name, he probably had Hurrian blood and was one of our relatives, so the great judge Pahoran uh, in the Book of Mormon. The, um, yes, he, he was the son of Nephi, wasn't he, I believe? Late in life, we find Abraham settling on Hittite land, which he buys from his honorable Hittite host while his children intermarry into Hittite families. There are some striking affinities between the social and customary usages of the Hurrians and the Hebrews, Patterson notes, and they are not accidental. Filer has found a hundred Hurrian names in the Old Testament. The names of the leaders seem to be the old Indic rather the, than the old Iranian, writes P.E. Dumont, a great authority on India. They're the Indian branch rather than the Iranian branch. And yet the Hittite branch shows at the same time both early Indic and Tokharian affinities. This Hittite branch shows Indian affinities. Mind you this, 
and rather close family affinities. This is the puzzling thing. And Tokar, way up here, uh, where you'd expect it. Anything but our ancestors or anything but Bible people, how these people move around. Well, they're called the hordes. You see, they're wandering people. He says, uh, the latter coming from eastern Siberian in prehistoric times. Thus we find Abraham rather intimately affiliated with people belonging to a complex of Indo-European speaking rulers who dominated the scene from the Pacific to the Atlantic in his day. The early Hittite record shows those people in close contact with the Achaeans. Lots of their letters. Here. Remember, we have a huge library, 30,000 letters here, from here, and many of them are letters from the Achaeans that pay visits. They have a horse trainer come and stays at the court and so forth. There are lots of intrigues with the princes, lots of political troubles with Homer's Achaeans. Here we are getting mixed up with the Greeks. Well, from another line, the Greeks are our relatives too. The, uh, the blonde, remember they, they're called, Homer calls them the blonde, the tall, the long-haired, blonde, blue-eyed Achaeans. And they come into the picture very prominently here. Actually, their associations were... Oh, we know that the Greeks were our cousins, but isn't that a rather indirect association between them and Israel? Actually, their associations were rather close and direct. We've shown elsewhere how in Lehi's time, Palestine and the whole of the Near East was full of Greek mercenaries and merchants. But we suggested particularly close resemblance between Lehi and the great Greeks of his day. He probably knew men like Solomon and Thales personally.